All right, can I just have confirmation that you can see my screen? We can see your screen. Thank you very much. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about Connecticut paid leave and how it applies to workers in the state. So we're gonna go through a brief agenda. We'll talk a little bit about what the paid leave authority is. We'll talk about FMLA, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, FMLA stands for the Family and Medical Leave Act which is actually a different law than Connecticut paid leave, but they're very much intertwined. So we will talk about that and how it relates to Connecticut paid leave and also how it's different. Um, we'll also, of course, talk a lot about Connecticut paid leave, including qualifying reasons to apply for uh, benefits under Connecticut paid leave and also to apply for job protection under FMLA. We'll go through eligibility requirements. We'll talk about how to apply. And we'll leave you with some additional resources where you can get more information and, of course, have time for Q&A at the end. So the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority is a quasi-public agency that oversees the Connecticut Paid Leave Program. We have five, uh, five main areas of focus. The first is outreach and engagement, so making sure that everyone who's impacted by Connecticut Paid Leave understands what it's about and how it works. We develop the policies and procedures needed to run the program. We establish the trust fund contribution rate and receive contributions. Um, little side note there is the, the contribution rate is set by the statute, so we can't increase it. Um, so that's a, just a little, a little caveat there. We approve and audit private plans, and that uh, applies to businesses who are purchasing their own insurance plan instead of participating in the state plan. And lastly, we administer claims for paid leave benefits. Some key dates that you may be aware of. Starting in January of this year, your employers uh, should have begun deducting contributions from your paycheck via payroll deduction. The contribution rate for everyone is one half of 1%, so 0.5%. And um, up until this point, there really hasn't been too much for workers to be aware of until a couple of weeks ago. On December 1st, we opened our um, online portal to begin accepting applications. And we accept applications both through the online portal and through our toll-free number, which I'll give you uh, later on in the presentation. So now you are able to put in an application if you know of a qualifying family or health event that's going to be happening um, in January that will cause you to need time off from work. So starting on January 1st, the benefits will actually become payable. Who is covered by Connecticut Paid Leave? Most employers who have one or more people working in Connecticut are considered covered employers. That does include nonprofits and private sector employers with a unionized workforce. Now, if you're a sole proprietor or you're self-employed, you are not required to participate in the program, but you may choose to opt in if you wish. If you do opt in, uh, you must remain in the program for a minimum of three years you would contribute at the same rate of um, other workers, one half of 1% of your self-employment earnings. And as another important note, um, as a sole proprietor, even if you choose not to opt into the program for yourself, if you have employees, you must withhold and remit contributions for those employees. There are a few um, exceptions as far as who is not covered by the Connecticut Paid Leave Program. So employees of the federal government are excluded as are employees of the state of Connecticut, except as to covered public employees, which I'll talk about in just a moment. The same is true for municipalities and local or regional boards of education. So um, unless they have covered public employees, they are exempt from the program. And employees of non-public elementary or secondary schools are also exempt. Then there are a couple of exemptions that are the result of other laws, and that includes railroad workers, people who are employed by the government of another state. So uh, even if they live in Connecticut, but they're employed by the government of Massachusetts, for example, they would be excluded. Employees of sovereign nations, which does include um, the two tribes that run our state casinos. Employees engaged in interstate commerce who work in Connecticut, but live in another state and then uh, pay income tax in the other state. So that would be um, truck drivers. And lastly, spouses of active duty military who do not pay taxes in Connecticut, but continue to pay taxes in their home state instead of the state where their spouse is deployed. So those are our exemptions. But the important thing to keep in mind is that for the most part, businesses in Connecticut with one or more employees are covered by the program. 
Now you heard me mention with municipalities and local or regional boards of education um, that if they have covered public employees, then those folks would be able to participate. So covered public employees include non-unionized employees of the state, unionized employees of the state if they have collectively bargained to be included, and for municipalities and local or regional boards of education, if the unionized employees collectively bargain to be included, then all the employees, both union and non-union, are included in the plan. And we have at the bottom of the slide there the definition of municipality. As you can see, it's um, pretty extensive. So it's not just towns and cities like you would normally think of when you hear municipality, but it can also include things like flood commissions, housing authorities, et cetera. So if you do work for um, a municipality in one of those aspects, you might wanna double check and see if um, it, you're probably excluded unless your union has bargained to be included. So how do the contributions work? Your employer um, takes one half of 1% as a payroll deduction from your paycheck. And quarterly, they remit those contributions to us here at the Paid Leave Authority. The contributions are post-tax and they're based on your wages as they're calculated for FICA purposes. The contributions are capped at the social security contribution limit. That's currently just shy of $143,000. So essentially, if you're in a position where you make more than that amount, you would not contribute more than $714 a year is what it works out to be. So we at the authority receive the contributions. We validate the information um, against other state agency data. The contributions are deposited into a trust fund and the trust fund is where the benefits will be paid from beginning in just a couple of weeks. Now, you heard me mention in the agenda, we're gonna talk about FMLA, which is the Family and Medical Leave Act and how it relates to Connecticut paid leave, which we um, often use the acronym CTPL. The biggest thing to keep in mind is that they are two different laws. It's really tricky because oftentimes people think that they're, they're both the same law and that just by having one, you're entitled to the other, but that is not the case. They are two different laws with um, two different sets of criteria. So FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act, has been around since the 1990s. There's a federal law and there's also a state of Connecticut law. And the purpose of both of those laws is to provide eligible employees with job protected time away from work for certain family and medical reasons. So that essentially means that if someone takes a leave of absence from work for one of the covered reasons, they're entitled to receive their same job back when they return. So their same position, their same pay, same schedule, et cetera. Um, however, the leave that's taken under FMLA is and has always been unpaid. So employers in some circumstances do provide uh, payment to employees who are on FMLA, and that may come in the form of accrued vacation or sick time that they can use. Some companies offer paid maternity or paternity leave, um, but that's at the discretion of the employer. It is not part of the Family and Medical Leave Act. It is not a requirement. Many employers, as I mentioned, do um, either require or permit their employees to use their accrual, so their sick leave, their vacation leave, et cetera, while they're out in order to have a source of income. Um, part of what we're going to talk about next is changes to Connecticut FMLA that will be happening on January 1st that may impact you. I'll preface it by saying at the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority, we don't have any um, oversight of FMLA that is under the purview of the Connecticut Department of Labor, but we do wanna provide this information again because it will impact uh, many, many um, Connecticut workers come January 1st. So here are the changes to Connecticut FMLA that you should be aware of. Up until this point, Connecticut FMLA only applied to businesses with 75 or more employees. That will change. As of January 1st, businesses with one or more employees will have to consider if someone going out on leave is eligible for job protection under Connecticut FMLA. Another change is that up until this point, in order to be eligible for job protection, you, you had to have worked for your employer for at least 12 months and at least 1,000 hours. That will change and the requirement will now be that you've worked for your employer for at least three months and there will not be a um, minimum number of hours worked requirement any longer. 
The employer can still permit or require you to use your accrued PTO if you're taking leave, but another change is that they will um, have to allow you to retain up to two weeks for your, of your PTO for future use. So for example, if you're having a surgery, your doctor says you're gonna need to be out for four weeks for recovery, and you have three weeks of accrued PTO with your company. Right now, your employer can say, you need to use all three weeks if you wanna get paid while you're out. But come January 1st, that will change. They would be able to tell you that you have to use one week of your PTO, but you would be, have to be able to retain the additional two weeks to be used at a future time. Now, if you said, I wanna use all three of my weeks now, that's fine, that's totally permissible. But if you did not want to, they would not be able to compel you to use that full amount of time. They would need to allow you to retain the two weeks for um, use later on in the year. So now what is Connecticut paid leave and how does it work in conjunction with FMLA? Uh, we often use the acronym CTPL and we use that to refer to the law itself to the public program and to ourselves here at the agency. So Connecticut paid leave provides income replacement for folks who are out of work for certain family and qualifying, um, qualifying family and health reasons. So if you think about it as you have, if you're going out on leave, you have FMLA that potentially could provide you with job protection, but it's unpaid. So it would give you the ability to get your same job back after you return from your leave. But Connecticut paid leave will provide you with the income replacement if your employer does not provide you with any. Um, but Connecticut paid leave does not provide job protection. So it is possible to be eligible for Connecticut paid leave, but not eligible for job protection. Um, you may also hear it referred to as PFML or paid family and medical leave, but we try to use CGPL just to make a bigger distinction between the two laws. Now, what are the reasons that you can apply? Um, and these reasons apply both to job protection under FMLA and to income replacement benefits under Connecticut paid leave. There are six different reasons. The first is uh, commonly referred to as medical leave, and that is leave that you as the employee would take for your own serious health condition. So to receive treatment or to recover from your own serious health condition. And um, serving as an organ or bone marrow donor does count as a serious health condition as does pregnancy. The second reason is called bonding leave, and that's leave that a uh, person can take in order to bond with a new child that has entered their home. That applies to birth, adoption, or foster care, and that leave can be taken at any time during the 12 months following the child's entrance to the home. Both mothers and fathers can take bonding leave, and if it's the case of adoption or foster care, Bonding leave can also apply to any pre-placement activities that the parent might need to participate in. The third leave is caregiver leave, and that's leave that an employee can take to care for their, uh, to care for a family member who's experiencing a serious health condition. And I'm going to talk in a minute about what the definition of a family member means, because it does not necessarily have to be someone to whom you have a blood relation. Here in Connecticut, we are one of only two states that has a provision for family violence leave. So if, uh, if you are the victim of family violence, you can take leave to, um, to seek medical attention, to relocate, to attend um, court proceedings, as well as a few other reasons. With family violence leave, you can take up to 12 days in a calendar year. And then the last two types of leave pertain to the military. One is called qualifying exigency leave, and that is for a worker whose um, spouse, child, or parent is notified of an impending call to federal active duty. So the employee could take time off prior to that deployment in order to address certain issues that they might need to take care of before their spouse, parent, or child leaves. That might be um, financial arrangements, seeing their attorney, arranging for alternative child care, or things of that nature. And then lastly, military caregiver leave, and that is where an employee can take leave to care for a family member, a military family member who was injured in the line of active duty in the armed forces. Now, when I talked about caregiver leave, I mentioned that um, that does not have to be taken for someone who's related to you by blood. So under the Connecticut law, the relationships that someone can take caregiver leave for include parent, spouse, a child of any age, a sibling, a grandparent or grandchild, 
or an individual related by blood or affinity. Now, what related by affinity means is if you have a relationship with someone that is the equivalent of a relationship that is listed in the statute. So, for example, you have an aunt who relies on you for care and you have a relationship with that aunt as though she were your mother. Your relationship is that close. That could be considered relationship by affinity. A more common example might be um, an unmarried couple who live together, they share finances, they share a home, perhaps they have children together, but they are not legally married. So they could also be considered to be related by affinity. So this um, expanded definition of family in the law means that people can care for those um, with whom they have that close relationship, even if there is legally no relation between them. Now let's talk about eligibility. Again, before I go into it, I want you to just remind yourself that FMLA and Connecticut paid leave are different laws. And not to complicate it any further for you, but there's also different requirements for federal FMLA than there are for Connecticut FMLA. Um, federal FMLA would only apply if your employer has 50 or more employees. Under federal FMLA, which is not changing, um, and which like state FMLA only provides job protection, job protection, but not income replacement. You must have been employed for at least 12 months, and you must have worked at least 1,250 hours in the 12 months immediately preceding your leave. Now in Connecticut, and again, these will be the requirements starting on January 1st, 2022, you will need to have been employed by your employer for at least three months, but there will not be any hours worked requirement. Now for Connecticut paid leave, so that's the ability for you to apply for income replacement benefits while you're out on leave. The requirements are as follows. You need to have earned at least $2,325 in what we call the base earnings period. So the highest earning quarter of the first four of the five most recently completed quarters. That can come from more than one employer. So if you work um, two or three part-time jobs, as long as your earnings from those covered employers add up to 23, 25 or more, you would meet that requirement. The second requirement is that you must currently be employed in Connecticut by a covered employer, or if you are not employed, you must have been employed within the 12 weeks immediately preceding your leave. Um, there's not a residency requirement uh, for Connecticut paid leave, except in the instance of sole proprietors and self-employed individuals. So sole proprietors must have opted into the program and they must also be residents of the state of Connecticut. Now, how long can you receive job protection or how long can you receive benefits? Federal FMLA provides up to 12 weeks of job protection in a 12 month period for all of the reasons that we reviewed earlier with the exception of military caregiver leave, which provides up to 26 weeks of job protection. Connecticut FMLA also provides up to 12 weeks of job protection in a 12 month period. Um, and like federal FMLA, it provides up to 26 weeks for military caregiver leave. The difference with Connecticut FMLA is that we do have that provision for family violence. So up to 12 days of the 12 weeks can be used for family violence leave. And there is the possibility that a person could receive an additional two weeks for incapacitation that occurs during pregnancy. Now, when we look at the income replacement benefits under Connecticut paid leave, there's up to 12 weeks of benefits available in a 12 month period for all leave reasons, including military caregiver leave. So if you're taking leave to be a military caregiver, you may be eligible for 26 weeks of job protection and up to 12 of those weeks could be paid under Connecticut paid leave. Like Connecticut FMLA, up to 12 days of the 12 weeks can be paid for family violence leave, and the possibility of those two additional weeks for incapacitation during pregnancy exists under Connecticut paid leave as well. Now you have the background, so let's talk about how you actually apply for benefits if you do need this, um, if you do need to take time. So the application process is now open. We are accepting applications for absences happening on or after January 1st. So if you know of something that is coming up, so perhaps you have a planned surgery, you're pregnant and you know that your baby is due in January, February, et cetera, you can apply now. The fastest and easiest way to apply is through our online portal. 
Um, we do also accept applications in a few other ways, um, primarily telephone, but we do also have mail, email, and fax available. The online portal, uh, some of the benefits are that, of course, you have 24-7 access. You can view the status of your claim. You can check payment status. You can upload documents, message with your case manager. So we are really encouraging anyone who's going to be applying to use the online portal. I just have a few quick slides to show you how you actually create an account with Connecticut Paid Leave. So the first thing you would do is go to our homepage, which is ctpaidleave.org. You would click, uh, there's a little blue sign in button in the upper right hand corner. So you would check on, uh, click on that. And then you'd be direct, redirected to a ct.gov website where you would be prompted to either log in or sign up now. You can see I circled sign up now at the bottom in red. Once you click sign up now, you'll be asked to fill out the information that you see, creating a username and password. Um, just a couple of notes, you want to make sure you use an email address that you'll have access to even when you're on leave and make sure that you follow the password security guidelines and write that information down because we're not able to change it once it's been created. There are a couple of different types of leave that can be taken. The most common is called block leave and that's continuous absence for a single qualifying reason. So you're having back surgery, your doctor says you need to be out for three weeks to recover. That's pretty cut and dried. There are also two other kinds of leave. One is called reduced schedule and one is called intermittent. So reduced leave reduces the usual number of working hours per work week or hours per day for a period of time. So for example, perhaps you normally work 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, but you're caring for an ill relative and you need to be off on Tuesdays to provide care for that person. That would be considered reduced schedule leave. Intermittent leave is leave that's taken in separate non-consecutive time periods um, for one single qualifying reason. So for example, perhaps you suffer from migraines and you sometimes need to take time off from work um, in order to rest when those are happening that's unpredictable. So that's considered intermittent leave. You might need a couple of hours one day, you might need a full day on another day, um, but it's all for the same reason. So the application process. We have partnered with Affleck as our third party claims provider. So once you go through that process of creating an account, as I showed you um, a few minutes ago, you will then be redirected to the Connecticut Paid Leave Affleck portal where you would be walk, you would walk through the steps of creating your account, uh, excuse me, creating your claim online. So you would be asked to provide a required documentation for the specific type of leave for which you're applying. Once you create your, um, once you create, submit your application, I should say, you would receive a welcome packet from Affleck that will outline the different documents that are required based on the type of leave you're applying for. We will also, uh, or Affleck will also provide you with an employment verification form. So that's a form where you'll fill out your name, your contact information on the top, and then you'll give that to your employer. They will fill out some information on the bottom portion and they'll return that directly to Affleck. And that's a, an important step in this process. Affleck will then look at what you've submitted and they will determine your eligibility. So to make sure you've met that minimum earning requirement that you work for a covered employer um, and that you had been employed within the previous 12 weeks. If for some reason they determine that you're not eligible, they would notify you. And at that point you can request what's called a reconsideration where we would look uh, at everything again and see if the same decision would be made or a different decision. Um, ultimately, after that reconsideration, if your claim was still denied, you would be directed to the Connecticut Department of Labor because they will be handling appeals for denials. If you're approved, AFLAC calculates the benefit amount. Um, if you earn minimum wage, you will receive 95% of your typical weekly earnings. If you earn more than minimum wage, there's a slightly different calculation, um, but it, in all instances, the benefit is capped at 60 times the minimum wage, which is currently $13 an hour. So the maximum weekly benefit is $780 per week. And then AFLAC actually issues the benefit payments. So you can choose to either have those funds directly deposited into your bank account, or you can receive them on a Visa debit card. The payments are made two weeks in arrears and they're issued on Tuesdays. 
So if you had a week of leave approved from January 3rd through 7th, you would actually receive your first benefit payment on January 18th. Just a little bit more information on how much you would actually receive. So as I mentioned, there's a slightly different formula based on if you earn um, minimum wage or above minimum wage. But to illustrate minimum wage earning, if for example, you work 40 hours per week, $13 per hour, then your base weekly earnings are $520 per week and you would receive 95% of that, which would be $494. I'm going to show you a tool that you can use in order to see what you might be eligible for on the next slide. Uh, we do have a benefits estimator on our website because we used to go through the calculation for folks earning above minimum wage and it is, it is quite a complicated um, a complicated formula. So to make things easier, we'll direct you to the calculator. Now, if your employer also provides you with some income replacement, whether that's in the form of PTO, short-term disability, et cetera, you still may be eligible for Connecticut paid leave, um, but in no circumstance can you receive more than 100% of your normal weekly earnings when all of the benefits are combined. And you're also not eligible for Connecticut paid leave benefits. Um, looks like part of what I typed got cut off, but that should say if you are receiving workers' compensation or unemployment. So this is what the benefits um, estimator looks like. If you go to our website and then from the tabs at the top, you can go to the tab called the process and drop it down to um, the page called four claims. At the bottom of the page, you'll find this benefits estimator. So you'll enter your pay period frequency, your gross earnings, and then the intended first date of leave. And when you click estimate, you'll see an estimation of how much you can potentially receive um, in paid leave benefits. Now, what happens if your employer does provide you with income replacement benefits while you're on leave? How does that intersect with Connecticut paid leave? Um, if you have a short-term disability policy through your employer, the intersection of the short-term disability benefits and the Connecticut paid leave benefits depends on the specific policy. So that's something that your employer um, would have to answer for you as far as who will pay you first. But in scenario number one, let's say our worker does not receive any employer provided PTO at all. In that case, the worker would, would be eligible for the full amount of Connecticut paid leave benefits for the full period of their leave. That's pretty cut and dried. In the second scenario, let's say that your um, employer provides you with PTO that's equal to the amount of your regular wages for, for the full time that you're out on leave. So you need to be out for a week. Your employer um, says you can use your PTO and you have enough PTO that you're able to retain the two weeks per the new Connecticut FMLA laws. In that case, you would not be eligible to receive any Connecticut paid leave benefits because you would be receiving 100% of your normal pay from your employer. And that's also pretty cut and dried. Scenarios three and four are where um, it becomes a bit more complicated. So in scenario number three, you as the worker receive some employer provided PTO, but it's less than your regular pay while you're on leave. In that case, you could receive paid leave benefits when your leave begins but the amount would be reduced to ensure that your total compensation did not exceed 100% of your normal earnings. And then in scenario number four, let's say the, the worker uh, receives employer provided PTO that's equal to their regular pay just for a portion of the time that they're out on leave. Maybe they need to be out for six weeks and their employer is providing them with PTO um, that is the same as their normal paycheck for the first two weeks. In that case, the worker is eligible to receive the full amount of the weekly Connecticut paid leave benefit, but the, the payments would not start until the worker had, uh, had stopped receiving the employer provided PTO. A couple of important notes for you as a worker in the state of Connecticut to know if you are looking into Connecticut paid leave benefits. Um, first, your employer should tell you if they will require or permit you to use any accrued PTO while you're out on leave. And you should keep in mind that they cannot require you to exhaust your PTO. They do have to allow you to retain up to two weeks if you would like to do so. They should also tell you whether they have any rules about the use of that time. So, for example, if you're taking caregiver leave to care for a sick relative, 
can you use your vacation time for that or do you have to use, uh, excuse me, can you use sick time for that or do you have to use vacation time? And if your employer offers a short-term disability policy that you participate in, they should be able to tell you um, what their policy says in terms of who pays first, do they have to, like, do you have to exhaust all your short-term disability um, before Connecticut paid leave pays or vice versa. What are your responsibilities as a worker? Now, again, we're going to go back to looking both at Connecticut paid leave and at Connecticut FMLA. So first we'll look at your responsibilities in applying for Connecticut paid leave. So if you are applying for income replacement while you're out on leave through Connecticut paid leave, here's what you need to do. First, of course, we want you to notify your employer that you are applying for Connecticut paid leave. We don't want them to be blindsided um, when they receive communication from us that you have a claim that's been approved or denied. So you can then begin a claim with Connecticut paid leave. If you wish to apply online, you have to, again, start with creating an account, as I showed. Once you submit that claim, your AFLAC case manager will provide you with a list of the documents that you need to provide based on the type of leave that you're taking. If you wanna get a jump start on this, um, we do have a list on our website that uh, breaks down by the particular type of leave, what kind of documents you would need to provide. And then you also need to notify your AFLAC case manager of any changes to your leave. So if you need an extension or if you in, uh, return to work sooner than you anticipated, you would need to notify them of that. Now, what's the process for Connecticut FMLA? This is strictly for the job protected portion of your leave. Um, again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, if you do have questions about Connecticut FMLA, how it works, what your rights are, those questions should be directed to the Connecticut Department of Labor because they are the ones who oversee Connecticut FMLA. Um, but the process is as follows. You notify your employer that you need to take time away from work. Um, the rule is 30 days in advance if the leave is foreseeable. So it's a planned surgery, you're having a baby, um, you know roughly when the due date is. If it's not foreseeable, if it's an emergency, you would just wanna notify them as soon as practical. Once you notify them, your employer has five days to let you know if you're uh, eligible for job protection. So that's not them actually approving your leave with job protection but that's them saying, based on what you've told me, it seems like this might be a reason that you can have job protection under FMLA. At that point, they would let you know if they need any additional documentation, like a medical certification or something like that. Once they tell you that, you have 15 calendar days to get all that documentation together. Um, if you're having a hard time obtaining any of the documents, your employer can provide you with an additional 15 days. And then once your employer has all of the documents they've requested, they have five days to review that and let you know if your um, request for job protected leave has been approved. They'll also notify you as far as use of your PT, PTO accruals, how they need you to report in during your absence. Do you need to provide a fitness for duty form before you return? And then your employer will track your usage to um, see that you do not exceed the 12 week limit. You, of course, should notify your employer if there are any changes, so if you're able to come back earlier, you need to extend your leave, et cetera. And when you return, your employer is to return you to the same job with the same schedule paying conditions, and they are not um, allowed to retaliate or discriminate against you for using job protection under FMLA. A couple of important notes for you. Even if you are approved, uh, when you are approved for Connecticut and or federal FMLA, it's important that you follow the attendance and call-in policies of your employer. And it's important that you notify your supervisor when you're taking FMLA leave. You are responsible for providing your employer and us at the Paid Leave Authority if you are also applying for income replacement benefits with complete and sufficient medical certifications. You should also know that there are other laws beyond FMLA that might apply to your situation and offer uh, job protection. And those include the Americans with Disabilities Act, which applies to companies with 15 or more employees, the Pregnancy Disabilities Act, which applies to companies with three or more, Connecticut Fair Employment Practices also applies to three or more, and workers' compensation um, can provide both job protection and income replacement if you have suffered an on-the-job illness or injury. 
Now, an important note is even if you, for some reason, don't want the time off that you're taking off to be designated as FMLA, it is your employer's right and responsibility to designate that time as FMLA. Um, and that provides protections both for them and for you. As I promised, I will leave you with some additional resources. So our website is the number one place I would send you. We have all kinds of information there. We have a four claims page that explains the step-by-step -step process for how to submit a claim. It has that benefits estimator that I showed you. We also have a page for employees that reviews um, the different reasons to apply for leave, what qualifies as a serious health condition. I would advise you to follow us on social media if you do not already, because we do post a lot of updates there as well as Facebook Live discussions. Our YouTube page has some different video tutorials. There's one on there that walks you through creating your paid leave account. And then there's another one that walks you through the process of actually submitting a claim. We do have a, a mailing list. We send out a monthly newsletter that you can um, that you can subscribe to if you would like that information. We have probably a couple hundred frequently asked questions on our website. And if you do still have a question after looking at all that, we don't have a call center, but we do have a contact us button on our website where you can submit your question or inquiry. And um, someone will get back to you usually within 48 hours. And you can request a phone call back if you would prefer to actually speak with someone as opposed to email. You can just indicate that on your contact us form and someone will call you. We also have an interactive quiz. So if you're thinking that there may be a reason that you um, will be taking leave and you want to see if you would be eligible for Connecticut paid leave benefits, this is on that for claims page that I showed um, right where the benefits estimator is. And it's just a quick six question quiz um, that will tell you if you are likely eligible for paid leave benefits. Again, I told you about our contact us portal, our videos. Um, and with that, I know it's a lot of information. Um, I see only one question that remains open, which is, is elective surgery qualifying? I think the answer to that really depends on if, if the reason you're having the surgery is considered a serious health condition. Um, that really is sort of the qualifier. Um, so, so if your, if your doctor says that that surgery, um, is the result of a serious health condition, then it seems like, yes, that would be a qualifying reason. And as Amber put in the chat, we're happy to provide live Q and A. If you have any questions, please do enter them. Um, we have about 20 minutes left, so I, I would be happy to answer anything. Um, one question is, what if the employee only has two weeks? I'm assuming that question is if the employee only has two weeks of accrued PTO. Um, and so under the changes to Connecticut FMLA starting in January, in that circumstance, the employer could not require you to use those two weeks. Um, and you would be able to apply to Connecticut paid leave for income replacement uh, instead of using those two weeks. Okay, another question was, so the worker has to apply for CTPL, not the employer, is that correct? That is correct. Um, if you as the worker want to um, apply for income replacement through Connecticut paid leave, you apply directly to the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority and in conjunction with AFLAC, we determine if your claim is approved, et cetera. The only role um, your employer has in that process is filling out that employment verification form that I mentioned. Uh, John asked, she's an employer and is asking if the employee submits all the forms to Connecticut. That is correct. Again, John, the, the only exception is that um, you your employee will give you the employment verification form after they fill out their portion, and then you will return that directly to AFLAC. And I see Amber put a link um, to the employer page in the chat. So yes, if you're an employer, please do look at that page. That has a lot of helpful information. Um, there's also a copy of the employment verification form for anyone who might want to take a peek at that in advance and see what kind of information is, is requested. And Jessica, I was wondering if for a moment, maybe we can direct folks for their FMLA related questions to the Department of Labor page. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, currently the Department of Labor is, uh, they're revamping and actually creating a whole bunch of new documents. Um, Amber, do you have that link? I know I found it yesterday. I do. I'm going to drop it into the chat real quick. Great. Thank you. So yes, any questions re related to FMLA, if you could please direct those to the Department of Labor because they are the, uh, the source that oversees that. And I know if you go and look and you're looking for something in particular and it's not there now, it should be shortly because I know that they are feverishly working to update all of that information. Okay, so I just found the website um, through the CTDOL and this will give you information on the Connecticut Family and Medical Leave, the final regulations, um, what the medical certificate requires and guidance. So I'm gonna drop that in the chat for you all now. So you can visit that site for all your FMLA related questions. Um, we do have a question. Uh, does the program operate on a fiscal year or a calendar year? I think this is, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is a question you're asking in regards to how much time the person gets. Is it like a one year calendar? We would be doing a rollback period. So 12 months prior to or 12 months ahead. And if that does not answer your question, please, by all means, go ahead and um, if you could maybe rephrase it. We have a quiet group today, Jess. Yes, I know. Very quiet group today. We, this is our lunch bunch. <laughs> well, we do have a little bit of time. So um, I know everybody is getting busy for the holiday. And I think yes, we can give everybody 15 minutes back to their day. Great, yes. And so Amber will send out um, a link with the recording and as well as with the presentation. So you will have all that within a few days. Um, so you're welcome to whoever the anonymous attendee that thanked us for the webinar, you are welcome. Uh, someone else asked if an employee works three months and they do not have enough money deducted to apply for PFML, how would that work? Um, so they have to, so the, the three months applies to the FMLA. Um, well, I guess actually, no, I, I should rephrase that. The, it does apply to both, right? Because 12 weeks is essentially a three month period. They have to meet both of those requirements to be eligible for Connecticut paid leave. So if they've worked for those 12 weeks, but they have not earned the 2325 in the base period as specified, then they would not be eligible to apply for Connecticut paid leave. Thank you, Jess. All right, Megan, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. All right, everyone. Well, we're going to give you a few minutes back for the rest of your day. We wish you a healthy and happy holiday and a happy new year. And uh, please keep your eyes peeled on our calendar of events and Hartford Business Journal. We'll be posting our winter webinar series that's coming up in January. So thank you again all for joining us. And thanks, Jess. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. All right. Bye-bye.